We are experiencing technical difficulties. Please stay tuned. Look out! Quick, get it back up! Hurry! We are experiencing technical difficulties. Please stay tuned. Are we all clear? Oh, okay, we're all clear. Great. All right, hit the red button. No, not that button! <laughs> Welcome to Cleveland Classic Cinema. Tonight's movie is 1961's Brainiac, directed by Chano Yuruda. Originally released as El Baron del Terror, this is without a doubt one of the most bizarre movies we've ever shown. I first saw Brainiac when my friend Ted Schroeder had a movie party at his house, promising to show the strangest film ever made, and let me tell you, it did not disappoint. I'd seen stills from it and read capsule descriptions about the movie in many of the film books I have in my library. But none of these prepared me for how incredibly out there this movie is. There haven't been many, if any, TV creature features in Cleveland that showcased Mexican movies, and that's unfortunate. I can say without fear or contradiction for, that for the most part, Mexican action films and horror films, in particular from the 50s, 60s, and 70s, are some of the strangest and most enormously entertaining movies I've ever seen. I can't really classify them as bad movies, at least not in the sense that I classify the movies on this show. While I don't think of the movies we show as cultural relics, all of them are. But they're American cultural relics. No matter how idiotic, nonsensical, or just downright awful they can be, they reflect a uniquely American outlook. I've seen movies made in foreign countries that reflect the same outlook after they've been dubbed into English. The original Godzilla is a prime example, that being a prototypical Japanese film, which, after it was Americanized, not only included new scenes starring Raymond Burr, but also deleted any, re any references to the A-bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, for which Godzilla was a metaphor. I'm sure this isn't something that happens only in America. For example, I know for a fact that uh, the Green Hornet TV show, when it was shown in China, it was named after Cato, and Bruce Lee got top billing, even though he was the Green Hornet sidekick. Culturalism is just regionalism on a bigger scale, I suppose. A personal aside here, I'm Italian, but I was born and raised in America. When an American travels, when a, an American travels to a foreign country, they get lectured that they're not in America anymore, so they have to observe the local rules and cultural mores. That happened to me when I went to Cancun once, and I was fine with it. I understand that. No one wants to come off as the ugly American after all. But why is it that when someone from a foreign country comes here, they can ignore the rules and mores of American culture and no one says anything? Just wondering. Getting back to the point, I wonder how closely the dialogue in this movie matches what is actually being said in the original Spanish soundtrack. Like just about every other Mexican movie shown in America, it was imported, dubbed in English, and distributed by K. Gordon Murray. In the first scene, there's a trial with so much expository dialogue in the first three minutes that I can just about guarantee you'll watch this movie twice just to get all of it. The good thing is, is that the dubbing sync is excellent in this opening scene, mainly because all the Inquisitors are wearing hoods over their heads. The second a witness for the defense comes in bareheaded, however, the whole thing goes south. Anyway, the guy on trial, a baron, gets sentenced to death since torture didn't seem to have any effect on him. In fact, from the looks of things, he enjoyed it, so when he's sentenced to death, it doesn't make much sense that he curses the guys who sentenced him, since you think he'd enjoy that even more. While being burned alive, he says he'll be back in 300 years or so to take vengeance on the descendants of his persecutors when this cartoon comet overhead during his execution comes around on another cycle. Although this is a typical curse, it never made sense to me. What in the hell do people 300 years removed from something have to do with what's happening at that moment? Why wait 300 years to get revenge? Couldn't you just as easily pop up in a week or two and take out everyone you're mad at? And who knows what the world's going to be like 300 years from now? The entire concept of revenge might not even exist anymore. And what if you come back and find out the family name has died out? Do you go to a genealogist and research the family tree so you didn't waste a perfectly good comment on the trip? 
They then burn the Baron in a fire that, according to the movie, burns for about 200 years, and then the movie jumps to the then-present time of 1961. This is where the movie really gets started, and there are some rear projection shots that are so lousy that they make this show look like it was done by ILM. After meeting the hero and heroine, we go to a local observatory and get another load of exposition about comets. While searching the sky for the comet, we see these great shots, you know, these great crystal clear shots of heavenly bodies hundreds of thousands of miles away. But when they find the comet, which turns into a sparkler when it gets closer to Earth, it's all blurry and out of focus. And why do they need an observatory to spot it when it was plain as day to the naked eye 300 years ago? For those of you who think I'm spoiling the, the movie, all of this takes place in the first 18 minutes, so relax. Besides, the best is yet to come. Once the Baron returns, and there's no way I'm going to spoil that scene, he turns into this hairy, balloon-headed, pointy-eared, long-nosed monster with a two-foot forked tongue that he uses to suck the brains out of the backs of his victims' heads. In fact, one of the taglines for uh, this film was brain-sucking terror. That's an apt description of what you get here, but I'm not so sure they're referring to the correct organ. After the hero and heroine bring their car in for a landing, just watch the movie and you'll understand that. They meet the Brainiac, who's now in his Baron disguise, having just sucked the brains out of a guy who watched him land in his comet, and luckily just happened to wear the exact size suit as the Baron. The dead guy is still in his underwear, so that kind of begs the question as to whether the, or not the Baron is all natural under the poor guy's suit. He keeps the brains in this big stemmed bowl, but spoons them out carefully into this thing that looks kind of like a martini glass. The first time he eats them, he looks as... You know, it looks like the thought of doing it is going to make him vomit, but he gags him down anyway. And although the brains have been sucked out of the victims through these two little holes, they're all still in one piece. I expected them to look like spaghetti at the very least. The acting in this movie is a little confusing. Characters seem to smile for no reason and have reactions to things that seem totally at odds with what's going on. Another thing I find confusing is when the Baron hypnotizes victims. Every time he does that, a light flashes in their faces, but seeing as the Baron neglected to bring the hypnotic eye along with him on this trip, just where this light is coming from is a matter of conjecture. Abel Salazar was born Abel Salazar Garcia on September 24, 1917 in Mexico City, Distrito Federal, Mexico. He was a very popular actor, director, producer, and writer in Mexico, where he starred in 74 films, produced 29, and directed 14. He's been referred to as Mexico's answer to Peter Cushing as he, he's played a vampire hunter in many of his films, but to me he kind of looks like a Mexican Sheldon Leonard. His first career was in business, but he began acting in 1941. His first role was in La Casa del Rancor, and two years later he produced, co-wrote, and co-starred in Tres Hermanos, a film about three Mexican-American brothers fighting for the U.S. in World War II. He starred in all kinds of films, but was best known for appearing in romantic comedies. His work increased in the 50s as he appeared in 19 films between 1950 and 1952. In 1955, he formed his own production company, EPSA. While casting around for subject matter, he asked himself how Universal made so much money and settled on the fact that their biggest grossing films were monster movies. So he made 1957's El Vampiro. He first cast a well-known star named Carlos Lopez Montezuma in the title role, but had second thoughts before shooting began. He remembered, I looked at American cinema again, and do you know what was successful? The unknown actor. He paid off Montezuma's contract and hired an unknown named Herman Robles to play the vampire Count Lavoud. The film was a huge success, and Salazar followed it with a sequel. El Atad del Vampiro in 1958. He enjoyed a long and successful career before dying from Alzheimer's disease on October 21st, 1995. One of the things I really like about Mexican movies, and television for that matter, is that the women in them are always really hot. Call me sexist, and maybe I am, but I like seeing beautiful women with heaving bosoms and sexy outfits and high heels, and Mexican movies have them in spades. If I ever show any of the vampire women, the wrestling women, the El Santo or the Aztec mummy series, you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. As enlightened as I like to think I am, you know, well, what can I say? I'm a guy. So right now, sit back, relax, and enjoy Brainiac, right here on Cleveland Classic Cinema.